do recording. Okay, I started recording because uh, some people told me that they cannot join, but I will have a recording. Okay, so recording is one. Uh, next thing I need to... Oh, I never know. Uh, how, how do I share my screen? Okay. I'm at the bottom of the screen. There's share screen. Uh, security Angry. participants chat. Yes, it's right in the middle. Okay. Uh, okay, so I can share the screen now. And... Uh, Okay, this, uh, well, you, you have it, I, I, I copied it into the chat window, right? But just a reminder. So, uh, come on. So we have tinycc slash uh, DS Friday, which is Data Science Friday. And we have tinycc dash data, I mean, slash data dash architect, where files related to data architecture. And then we have GitHub, my GitHub, and I have the interview prep repository. Uh, and then uh, there's a directory there called Data Architect. And I actually go there, but I do it locally because I have local copy of uh, my repositories. So it's uh, GitHub, CD, interview prep, Data Architect. I'm using Fish uh, Shell, which is very good uh, at... Uh, figuring out what it thinks I want to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> it offers me correct directories and so on. Okay, so I open this directory, open this directory. And uh, so we had lecture one, we had lecture two last time. Uh, today we're talking about distributed systems and next time we're talking about SQL Modern Data Warehouse. And then um, we will uh, think I already spoke with Brad. Uh, Brad, say hi to the team. Hey everyone, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. So uh, Brad is absolutely incredible and he is uh, a data scientist analyst and uh, he will be uh, attending our seminar. And he said that he can do presentation about Beam. Uh, so maybe uh, I, I have to rewrite this. And we will have uh, Tyler talking about uh, Synapse and, and stuff, whatever. So we'll cover a lot of architecture in the future. So let me uh, start what we already covered. Uh, so first introduction was just an importance that people, uh, data architects uh, in big demand, uh, good salaries, that we will do like fast push like becoming data architect, know the terminology. Of course, it doesn't substitute uh, for the experience, but it allows actually to pass the interview because the demand is so high. And then uh, we spoke about what architects actually do. They are not coding. They are mostly talking to clients, figuring out what the clients uh, want, what kind of data they have, and uh, look at different architecture templates, which are already available and propose which one is good fit for the client needs. Right, and data architects uh, also responsible for a lot of stuff like good practices, uh, security, cataloging data, like whatever. And uh, they need to know some technical terms, right? And that's why we're spending these two lectures uh, talking about some technology. And they need to know how things are done on different clouds, like on Amazon, on Azure, and uh, on Google. Um, and also, Okay, this is Beam, how you discuss uh, stuff, uh, how you make your star schema, uh, how you talk to business people and extract information from them. And there are some resources. Okay, this was the first lecture. Uh, the second lecture was uh, more appropriate for uh, like a software analyst, uh, like programmer, uh, like a lot of technical stuff about algorithms and the data structures. And uh, there are some websites where you can do a lot of training, uh, write code. So we're talking about uh, basic uh, data structures and again, and more and more like uh, hashes, dictionaries, uh, consistent hashing, which we'll see today a lot. 
uh, this is basically load balancing, uh, how you insert a load balancing between two uh, clusters of servers, so that when you update, upgrade, or change something, uh, like uh, things work uh, well. Well, okay, bloom filter, uh, search trees, linked list, uh, binary heaps, which is uh, very important. Um, this is more like a list of different terms. You really have to spend some time and maybe Google all this stuff, uh, like to figure it out for yourself because lectures are too short. Like topological sort, uh, like Khan algorithm is very famous. Everybody is using it and it's very simple, right? You have jobs, you find jobs which don't have dependencies, run them first, then uh, remove them, <laughs> uh, then find the jobs uh, which maybe were depending on those and this was already done. So now you run those and so on. Um, okay, different kind of searches, uh, depth first or breadth uh, first. Uh, algorithm complexity, big O notation, and uh, okay, bit operations. And I put it here because uh, I had this bad experience with people even having computer science degree and didn't understand the difference between bit and byte. So here I put, okay, byte is eight bits, right? <laughs> like and you can do operations on bits. Uh, typical algorithmic uh, tasks, uh, uh, a Turing machine complexity and uh, okay a little bit more on like how you find path and how your GPS in the car works okay so this was lecture number two and today will be lecture number three and I want you to relax because a lot of this stuff uh, I mean it's too much for one lecture and a lot of this stuff is absolutely not needed for uh, I am, am I actually showing? Yes, I'm showing my, okay. Uh, so session three about distributed systems design. As you know, uh, nowadays, everything is distributed. It's not one computer, it's a cluster of computers. So people think about scaling, how uh, maybe to partition your data. Sharding is a very common thing where I don't know, let's say you process uh, men on one server and women on another server. Like you may, you may have a hundred servers and each one processes some subset of your data. Uh, load balancing, right? Uh, so when you have hundred servers and you have requests coming in, like uh, first request goes to the first server next to the second server and so on. So you can rotate between them or use some clever scheme how, how you do it. Uh, reliability, redundancy. So you put more than one, you avoid a single point of failure. It's a very important idea. Uh, message queues, it's kind of like postal office. Uh, you like, like sending email, but you're sending uh, data messages inside your system. Uh, consistent hashing, uh, we already discussed it. Uh, distributed caching. Okay, this, this, this is really important, right? So you did something and you want to keep it for some time in memory, like so that the next request will go fast. And when you have huge uh, data, like Facebook, we're talking about billions of users, right? Uh, you cannot keep uh, this in memory of one computer. You need to distribute this cache between uh, many, many computers, sometimes millions of computers. So how you distribute your cache and how you make sure that you know on which server to go to get the cache. And the answer is, uh, of course, <laughs> consistent hashing. <laughs> okay, um, how you uh, scale your performance, the security authentication, tokens, whatever. So these are all important keywords. Uh, and the, here are some good sources of information. Gurav Zen, I love this guy. He's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, lectures on YouTube. Um, he recommended this book, uh, Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Klepman. It's O'Reilly book. Again, highly recommend. Uh, educative, um, they have uh, good stuff, um, what, whatever. Just check, check these links. Okay, uh, scalability can be horizontal and maybe vertical. Vertical means you just uh, make bigger and bigger and bigger computer with more memory and more cores. And horizontal means uh, things like Hadoop, 
or Spark, whatever. So more computers, maybe thousands of computers. And uh, what I see that this approach actually wins. Uh, so you need to know how to do things like this. So you have more computers and you distribute your calculations between those computers. So all big companies like Google, Facebook or whatever, that's the approach they take. So that's what this whole lecture is about. Uh, microservice versus monolithic architecture. Yeah, monolithic means like a huge computer and microservice means that you have many parts which communicate and send messages to each other. Uh, allows to do scalability, you decouple things, it's easier to design so each piece can be separately designed as long as you have a contract of how these pieces communicate with each other. It's easier to train, let's say you have a distributed model, uh, different uh, business groups can deal with different pieces of the system, different deployment schedules, uh, whatever, separate Git repositories. So it, it is easier, like when the system becomes too big and complex, like for example, Microsoft Windows, uh, it kind of... Uh, <laughs> uh, gets destroyed by its own complexity and tumbles uh, under its own weight, right? Uh, the whole reason why a Unix operating system became so successful is because by design, it consists of small pieces which can interact with each other in a flexible way. So uh, every time when you can decouple and split and make things work together, uh, it is better. And that's uh, what's happening. Uh, but of course, if you have big system, you need more people. Well, you need more people anyway, when you have big system. You have more par parts, more complexity. Uh, yes, but it's also true for, for monolithic when it becomes big. Can perform as fast as monolith because of network delays. Well, yes, this is true. <laughs> I cannot argue with that. Um, so there is an old idea of model view controller architecture. And what it is, is very simple. So you have uh, your data and uh, it is, uh, let's say in a database, database has some model and people use the word model to describe your, your data, your structures with data. And then on the front, you have view, you have application front end. And in the middle, you have controller, which is uh, your scripts, your business logics, your, I don't know, Python scripts or Java servlets or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, so it's called MVC and it existed for as long as I remember, like maybe 20 years, maybe more. Like, I don't know who invented this idea. Uh, so model view controller, they're out of order. Like it should be view controller model or model controller view, but whatever, it's called MVC. And it's still uh, very viable and it still works. Uh, the only difference that now people decide, well, uh, we have here a lot of servers in the middle uh, cluster. So we need to put some load balancing here and we need to put some load balancing here. Uh, guys, when I move mouse, do you see my mouse moving? Hello? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. So, uh, uh, and if you use this approach with uh, multiple servers here, um, you need to make them stateless, right? Because if uh, client A uh, spoke to some server here, and then next time he sends a request and he gets to a different server, uh, where like the memory, like, so if, if you use uh, this simple architecture, you need to make them stateless and all the state will be either on the browser like a cookie, or it will be on this side somewhere in the data. Now sharded architecture, when you split, uh, different servers serve a different kind of clients. Somehow you split and they're completely parallel, completely separate. So some applications are done like that. A Lambda architecture, this is kind of a mixture. So you have batch processing, which is kind of old school. Uh, so you have database, uh, you have uh, uh, batches of data. It's called bounded data. And it has high latency because you processing uh, a lot of data at once. Or you have streams when you send individual messages and this is called unbound data and it has low latency, but it requires more resources uh, to, to process. 
And the reason why here I try to give an example. So this is uh, blood cells, erythrocytes, which uh, inside them, they have hemoglobin molecules which transport oxygen, right? And uh, this is kind of example of batch versus st uh, stream. So erythrocytes transporting hemoglobin molecules. Uh, so each erythrocyte may be considered as a batch, right? And stream is when uh, you destroy the membranes of uh, erythrocytes. So hemoglobin molecules, uh, molecules go outside and float by themselves. And uh, so each message is separate, right? And the problem with this is that there are so many individual messages and each one, so it becomes, uh, the, um, the liquid becomes very viscous and the blood have difficulty to flow. If, uh, so, so batches are, are good because you can send like thousands of rows or millions of rows at once, right? Uh, easier to, to monitor, easier to handle than to handle each message separately. Uh, well, you can still uh, handle each message separately and that's what uh, modern streaming uh, systems like Kafka do. Uh, but uh, j just to explain, so streaming architectures where you have those individual messages. So th there's no central database, there is no batch loading, everything is a message, uh, messages uh, streamed, uh, sent, whatever. You have a message bus, uh, buses, you can put something on a queue, you can take something from the queue, you can subscribe, you can push, you can pull but it's all about messages. So this is streaming architecture. Okay, request re resp response uh, chaining. Uh, you understand what it is when you have a chain and uh, you send message from A to B, from B to C and so on. Um, so you, you may have some uh, timeouts, uh, whatever. Uh, publish subscribe model. Again, I, I just read through these uh, things, maybe not connected to each other. Um, I just want to introduce some uh, terminology because if you don't know what it is, you can look it up on Wikipedia and so on, right? Um, uh, publish subscribe. So we add message broker between publish subscribe nodes like Kafka, RabbitMQ and so on. Um, they it used to be messaging like on Wall Street 20 years ago, everybody used uh, MQ. Uh, well, uh, not everybody, but many people use the uh, uh, IBM MQ series or they use some other messaging. And uh, there is a lot of commercial messaging products. Uh, but then uh, nowadays it's uh, overrun by open source like Kafka. <laughs> and, uh, and messaging is very good because it allows you to decouple pieces in your system, right? It's kind of uh, having an email. You send a message and you forget about it. And then later it will be delivered. Uh, things event driven on each step you can use a log of events so this is how transactions are processed in the database uh, on one side you do something and it goes to the log and then on the other side or in like when you replicate it uh, it uses the log to do the like consistent thing as required push versus pull distributed data sync and distributed transactions like main idea you have at least three servers to get consensus of at least two, right? So we need two first. Uh, if one server fails, M servers failed, we need two M plus one working servers to vote. Okay, so you, you will see this idea in many systems. Okay, failures in big systems is a certainty. And here it's a simple uh, uh, example. So suppose you have a uh, system which consists of pieces where each piece can fail, uh, but with a very small probability of one failure in 100 days, right? So probability of survival for each piece is this, right? It's almost one, it's good. But uh, suppose we have 30 elements and we have seven days, the probability of survival is, so we take probability of survival of one element and we go seven days by 30 elements. So this is the power and we get 12%. So almost 90% probability that something will go wrong. But if we have 300 elements, then like it's, it's a certainty that something will go wrong. 
And in real systems, we, we may have like thousands of pieces. In, in fact, that's exactly like if you look at modern, uh, I don't know, Hadoop systems, whatever, they have thousands of servers and each server have like many moving parts as well. So something will go wrong and you need to build the system so it heals itself. Uh, so problems will happen. You need to design all your processes so that they handle failures. You need to avoid single point of failure. We spoke about it. So you need to have some fault tolerance. You have to think about it. A redundancy. So you can put multiple servers. Uh, the old, uh, old, uh, how to say, good old approach is use uh, master slave. So you just have one and you have another one and information or whatever uh, data is copied consistently from master to slave. So when master die, uh, dies, uh, slaves, uh, uh, starts working, uh, takes over uh, the work. Uh, replication, so from master to slave, replication. Geographical redundancy, you have one system in one state, another system in another state, or even in another country, right? Uh, load balancer, it may be DNS, so just uh, on your DNS records, and you have several records pointing to different servers, and it just rotates uh, uh, between those different IP, IPs. Although this thing, uh, DNS is a very primitive protocol. It doesn't uh, remember that, okay, if request came from user A, send it to the same server next time, right? So th this is very primitive way uh, to do re re load balancing. Uh, okay, information redundancy, time redundancy, physical redundancy, quorum-based whatever, we don't have time. I'm actually behind the schedule really heavily. Uh, primary server failover, secondary server, which is uh, master-slave, active data, data replication, mirror data, whatever. The, the main ideas are the same, just a little bit different language. Okay, distributed uh, transactions, uh, two-phase commit uh, protocol. Uh, very simple idea. You you need to transfer money from one account in New York to another account in California. Uh, so you first uh, send, okay, uh, so you have two systems in different places. So you need a coordinator, uh, which will keep track of what's going on. So you uh, send a request, uh, they do they kind of do thing, but they uh, don't commit it. So on one side, they subtract, on another side, they add, and then you send them a command. Okay, if they both uh, replied, then you say, okay, commit. Or if only one replied and another didn't, then you say roll back. Okay, and then acknowledgement, and this is done. Uh, this is good. This works in most uh, cases, but people also created uh, more elaborate schemes uh, because you, you can think what will happen if something will goes offline, if some uh, network connection, what if a coordinator <laughs> become in, inaccessible or like whatever. So uh, people decide to make a more complex system and they uh, use voting, right? So you have more servers, whatever. So it, it describes this. Uh, recovery strategies in case of failure. So uh, how you recover. Uh, uh, concurrency, um, yeah, th there is a uh, interesting question. Uh, what is the difference between parallel execution and concurrency? Uh, so concurrency is uh, like, let's say you have one CPU and you have several processes and they share this CPU. So the CPU periodically switches between the processes. This is concurrency. A true parallel execution when you actually have parallel processes running in like on different cores, on different CPUs in parallel. Okay, uh, saga pattern. Oh, okay, so let's say you need to reserve the hotel, car and plane ticket. But if something goes wrong, like for example, if you cannot reserve the plane ticket, uh, but you already reserved the hotel, right? So you need to like cancel whatever uh, relative uh, related reservation. So it's the whole thing is called saga. And it's all together should happen or not happen. Uh, uh, cache invalidation, uh, yeah, this this is another interesting thing. So how long you you need to keep cache and uh, how you invalidate it? And uh, okay, 
first in, first out, uh, cash eviction, or uh, last in, first out, or whatever. D different schemes, uh, how you clean your cash. Really don't have time for that. Okay, distributed caching. They use consistent hashing to, to manage it. Okay, uh, I really want to, to run through the whole thing. It's not that important. You don't need to know it. I just want you to kind of be introduced to a certain vocabulary. So master-slave sharding, we already spoke a little bit about it. A load balancer to avoid single point of failure. And there are different ways to do load balancing. Uh, different uh, software or hardware devices uh, for that. And uh, many, many questions uh, you, you may want to ask when you're thinking about load uh, balancing. Like for example, let's say you're making a HTTPS request and it goes through load balancer and then it goes through some servers and then it goes through whatever. Uh, at some point you need to remove the S like in HTTP. So it may happen at the level of a load balancer or it may happen later, right? And so on. So there are many like engineering decisions you may need to decide. Proxy servers, right? Uh, so proxy is just intermediate uh, server. You as a user can use proxy server to hide your IP. And then uh, from the server side, you can also put proxy which hides servers. And this is usually called uh, inverse proxy. Uh, okay, it's like a front end server which hides what uh, behind it. Uh, cap theorem. Okay, very famous thing, a very common question on interviews. Uh, cap is consistency, availability, partition tolerance. And I actually want to kind of explain. Um, so what it says is a very simple fa fact that you never can guarantee all three, <laughs> right? And, and here is an example. So you have two people uh, and they're using a Google Docs document. So, so they, they're working uh, remo remotely together, right? And one of them has a wife. Okay, so uh, consistency and availability. You work on a document remotely with a partner. There is no partitioning between you. So both have access to the data and uh, you can answer to your wife query, like she may ask something about the document. So you have consistency and availability, meaning you can tell to your wife what's going on. But suppose that internet stopped working. So now you have partitioning, right? So suppose we're talking about consistency and partitioning. Uh, so you partitioned and at this point, uh, when a wife asks something, you will not answer. So availability is lost. So until you get back the connection, uh, you will not uh, answer any questions, right? So you're losing availability. And another thing you can do, uh, availability and partitioning. So you lost access, but your wife asks you and you tell her something which may be not consistent with what your partner uh, maybe he changed something on his side uh, you don't know so availability with partitioning but then no consistency so this example is actually what cap theorem means there is nothing more complex there so now you know cap theorem okay Distributed computation. Well, you're familiar with MapReduce, which came from uh, Google, uh, was it like 20 years ago? And then it's Hadoop, H uh, HDFS, uh, Hadoop Distributed File System, Spark, uh, RDDs, uh, which is what, resilient uh, distributed data sets, right? Databricks, which is using them. So MapReduce, you send, you map your request to thousands of computers, they do some calculation and then they send the result back and you reduce them to show on Google search screen, right? MapReduce, this was coined by Google and this is how distributed calculations are done. Uh, it may be as simple as a word count and shuffle or search or whatever. Okay, RDD, Resilient Distributed Dataset, Hive, Kafka, different systems, Databricks, Delta Lake, distributed transactions. So recently Databricks has introduced uh, Data Lake. Uh, the idea is uh, how transactions are done. You have a log file. 
and before you do something you put a record i'm about to do this and then <laughs> you write okay i just did that and so on and uh, that's how you uh, do transactions and they uh, made this mechanism as part of databricks and azure polaris i think um, i spoke about it so this is a distributed algorithm uh, used uh, in azure uh link uh, to cosmos db uh, and also in serverless sql in synapse so this is uh, basically stolen from databricks how you split your data in thousands of pieces for faster distributed processing okay so you have messaging and streaming and you have all these words microservices produces subscribers brokers uh, persistence uh, kafka topic producer consumer broker whatever it's 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 all quite quite simple and you don't really need to know like you you, you can look it up uh, uh, as an architect you just need to know the ideas not to actually do it uh, kafka's topic is basically a pipe a messaging bus okay when topic gets uh, big we replace it in several partitions blah 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 uh third calculation oh okay doesn't matter uh, no SQL databases. So there are a whole bunch of uh, no SQL databases because most of the data is unstructured, right? So one of good examples is Apache Cassandra developed by Facebook, which they still use, but uh, surprisingly, they actually use mostly MySQL database, not Cassandra. But Cassandra is a very interesting beast. It's a hybrid uh, database. It's uh, wide like a lot of columns and it can be queried using different apis a multi data center it's a global a multi nodes redundancy replication recovery it's it's, it's really interesting like uh, read about uh, this uh, mongodb uh, json documents right uh, uh, i think it was the first one at, at least uh, uh, for me it was the first one so it's a json documents um, HBase, Hive, uh, key value store. There are so many key value stores. Uh, like, again, just uh, look at them. Uh, graph based database is becoming more and more popular. Uh, and uh, what key value stores, document databases, white column databases, graph databases, asset transactions, atomic, at, uh, atomic consistency, isolation, durability. So this is kind of what, what it means to have a transaction. Again, we'll not go into this. Uh, I have uh, just a few slides left. Okay, white column stores uh, talking about, uh, well, Google Big Table kind of considered to be very, very wide with literally millions of servers, right? We're talking about millions of columns, but the data is very, very sparse. It's mostly empty. Okay. Uh, and then Cassandra and the other databases kind of uh, follow uh, this structure. Okay, uh, sort and string tables, LSM trees. This is how Cassandra works. Log structured merge trees. It's very interesting. Again, uh, you would think of a table as a monolithic structure, but that's not how it works under the hood. It's split into small pieces and those pieces process separately. You will see this pattern over and over again like how things work under the hood. Uh, uh, RocksDB, it's an a engine uh, which is used in uh, MySQL. Um, you see in like Facebook switched to use RocksDB under the hood. Uh, Stack Overflow architecture. Oh, this is just interesting example. That's Stack Overflow, which everybody knows. Surprisingly, don't use distributed architecture. They use .NET. <laughs> And they use SQL Server and C Sharp, and actually works very well. Uh, I said uh, they don't use distributed. They no, they probably do use. But uh, I was just like, uh, for me, it was really interesting that it's not Linux based. Actually, again, it's maybe not true. Maybe they are Linux based because .NET runs on Linux. I don't know. Anyway, uh, which databases Facebook use? And uh, they use MySQL as their primary. And these are some numbers, whatever. I, I was just trying to, to figure out something for myself. Okay, uh, data partitioning. So you break big data into smaller parts. Uh, it's always uh, what people do. Maybe use sharding, 
uh, you see database one for user data, this is for friends list, this is for photos and so on. Just example of how you split. Okay, um, uh, secure hash algorithms. Uh, MD5, SHA1, SHA2, SHA3, <laughs> whatever. Um, so um, if you have two files, uh, what's the simple way to compare if the files are the same or not? You take the file and you calculate its uh, hash, its signature. And there are different algorithms uh, coming th through the years. So uh, SHA3 is 2013. And you see that uh, from a short signature, uh, now they're becoming much, much, much longer and much, much more secure, right? So MD5, uh, you're not supposed to use nowadays because it's easy to break, like if you use it for security or something. Okay, browser web server communication protocols. You have HTTP request, Ajax, uh, long polling, web sockets, servers, uh, sent events, whatever. Uh, you usually need some sort of monitoring, you need logging, you need to send alerts, you need some sort of health service, right? Uh, open source distributed key value store used by Kubernetes to hold configuration state and so on. And it's called etcd. Okay, I don't know why I put it here. Okay, leader election consensus algorithms. Denial of service attack. Okay, DSA. And even worse, there is a thing called DDSA, which is distributed denial of service attack. <laughs> okay, cascading uh, failure prevention. Okay, so some ways to do this. What is this? Uh, GraphQL, open source data, query manipulation language, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Okay, some stuff. Single sign-on, yes, everybody is doing this. You definitely, if you're not familiar with single sign-on, there are a lot of tutorials on YouTube which explain how, how it works. You have to know how it works. <clears throat> okay, uh, binary search tree. B plus trees. Uh, this is what actually used in uh, 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 to do indexes. Base64 encoding, uh, which is used uh, to send uh, binary data as text, and URL encoding. Well, you're familiar with that, right? Uh, how you put some special characters into URLs uh, using percent notation. Uh, so you use percent and then a hexadecimal representation, like for example, percent 41 is A. Well, you can actually use A in a URL, but like whatever, it just shows how it works. Okay, I stop sharing, I'm done. Uh, oh gosh, it was fast. <laughs> Sorry. I just no, kind, of, kind of vomited all this stuff.